This is Derry, a small city in Northern Ireland, home to around 100,000 people. I'm nephew of Johnny Johnson. Johnny was shot on Bloody Sunday, wounded and died a couple of months later of his injuries. Derry has a dark past. On the 30th of January 1972, 14 innocent protesters were shot dead by British paratroopers. The reason people were marching on Bloody Sunday was because of internment. We're determined that we were going to get to the bottom of this, that we were going to see this thing through, however long it took. It took 38 years, but we've made it. My name's Jimmy Duddy. I'm nephew of Johnny Johnson. Johnny was shot on Bloody Sunday, wounded and died a couple of months later of his injuries. This is Derry, a small city in Northern Ireland, home to around 100,000 people. Derry has a dark past. On the 30th of January 1972, 14 innocent protesters were shot dead by British paratroopers. That day would go down in history as Bloody Sunday. This is a film about the struggle over the truth of what happened that day. A struggle between local Derry people on the one hand and the British establishment on the other. Two years before the shooting took place, the British Army had been called into Northern Ireland to keep the peace. Internment had been introduced. In the small hours of the morning, the British Army would raid people's homes. Those suspected of being IRA members would be taken away and put in prison, but without having a trial. The reason people were marching on Bloody Sunday was because of internment. Because the British government and the Unionist government here on the 9th of August 1971 had introduced internment. In other words, they would now bypass their whole judicial system and intern people without trial and without evidence. By January uh, 72, there were hundreds of uh, men, all men at that time, hundreds of men imprisoned in an internment camp, uh, charged with no offence, much less tried with any offence. The only response that the people had here in Derry was to march on the streets to march and demand civil rights. So this march that we know as Bloody Sunday was a civil rights march. I remember the day quite well. It was um, a day which was obviously very crisp uh, and cold. Uh, I remember Gerald Donaghy coming to my house early in the morning, uh, wanting to see if my young brother was going to go on the march with him. We told him, yes, we were going to the march. Everybody's heart was lifted. You know, everybody was in good form, you know, you see everyone you turn, everybody was smiling and chatting. You know, I think it was just the crowd. And it was, although it was a winter's day, it was uh, a cold but sunny winter day. There was a feeling that we could move mountains. Yeah, no, this is 7-6, uh, the crowd is waving, chanting, and, but causing no particular aggro. There were riots before the shooting, but we had lots of riots. There were riots every Saturday and Sunday uh, in Derry anyway. So nobody thought that the riot was going to develop into anything really dangerous. I remember coming away to begin walk from the little riot at the bottom of the street and a friend uh, saying to me, ah, well, another friendly little Derry riot. You know, and that was about three minutes before the shooting started. You want me to shoot him, Norman? He's not in his hands at the moment. I want to shoot him dead. I 
I was absolutely terrified. I immediately took to my heels and ran. I remember being be, behind a wall, and the bullets were actually hitting the wall, and, the, and it was people were lying on, uh, on the ground, men, women, and children, screaming in panic. I came round the corner, and I found uh, a, a particular man with his head blown off. Jackie Doddy was getting carried uh, around by Bishop Daly, well, Bishop Daly wasn't, but three or four people carrying him, which in the blood. And you you really look at him, he was dead. Like, I seen Paddy Doherty lying on the ground. Uh, Paddy was dead. We just couldn't believe that they could start shooting people at random. Jimmy's uncle, Johnny Johnson, was shot that day. He died from his injuries some months later. But he wasn't the only person whose life would be taken that day. I then met up with my young brother. He says, Jerry's been shot. They've taken his body away. When they took... Jerry's body to the hospital. The British Army stopped that particular car, took his body, and they planted nail bombs on his on his possession and let him die. Uh, sorry, four hours, sir. Uh, a car has just pulled up. In the car was one wounded man returned to this location. Has a nail bomb in his pocket, over. Not only did they kill him, but they also killed his reputation as well. Uh, yeah, this is not in general, sir. There's some photographers at the Rossville flats. Fourteen people died because of the shootings that day, and 13 people were left wounded. Afterwards there was confusion, disbelief, bewilderment, and fear, fear, terror, uh, then grief. Uh, and then determination, determination after that. Feelings begin to harden into a determination that we weren't going to allow them to do this uh, to us, that the days when deprived communities like the Bogside allowed themselves to be walked all over by military might, the those days were gone. We weren't going to allow it. Yeah, this is 7 6. Apparently, there is still a body lying just south of the Rossville flat with some civilians around it. Over. My mother was a chief commander in the British Army. She became pregnant. She was going to expect a baby, but she didn't want it. I was going to be unwanted. There was a, a sort of a situation across in England where unwanted children were sent to Ireland, always sent to families in Ireland who they'd never be seen again. Could you give me a report, please? This is Golf India 3, Golf Golf Yankee. Jimmy Porter has lived in Derry all of his adult life. And during the times of the Troubles, he used to tune into the Army's radio frequency. The thing would pick up speech, and um, that was recording everything was happening in the Army military communications. Knowing there was going to be at the parade, I had switched on the equipment so that that would run all day long, and I could picture it all and just sit listening to it. And the next thing, their shots have been fired. 18, one high velocity shot at OP Echo. Strike scene, no indication of where the shot came from. So the whole thing is on one particular tape. I think it was very important. The army knew that there was nobody shooting at them. That uh, without the tapes, they could have said that they were being attacked or they were being shot at and so forth. But, and, but on the tapes is all, there was no mention of anybody shooting at, at the army, that is. And it's just simply that people, innocent people who were going about their business were being shot. So it was in business, uh, radio and television engineering uh, uh, in William Street. And I thought the safest, not to have the tapes here, but to have the tapes up on William Street. This is where the tapes were always held. The day of the funeral, funerals, you couldn't have got into the chapel. Couldn't even get into the ground of the chapel. Uh, we stood in the, the grass field beside it, himself and Martin. There was 60, 70,000 people. They had loudspeakers so the people outside could hear. You know, I mean, obviously there were that many people you couldn't have got to anywhere near the gravesides. But obviously then people were thinking of what's going to be done about it. They murdered people broad daylight. Immediately after Bloody Sunday, the British government appointed the Lord Chief Justice 
the highest judge uh, in Britain, uh, Lord Widgery, to come over to Northern Ireland and to carry out an inquiry into what exactly had happened. On the day he was appointed, that's the 1st of February, uh, 1972, Lord Widgery had a meeting with the Prime Minister of the day, Prime Minister Edward Heath. Uh, the meeting was recorded and we've got the minutes of the meeting. And uh, I, Mr Heath told Lord Widgery to remember when he went to Northern Ireland that we, that is the British, were uh, involved not just in a military war, but a propaganda war. There was Widgery and two of his men uh, with him in the room when, when I was sent. Oh, I know all about you. He said, your, mo your, uh, your mother has been a patriotic lady. Where is your patriotism? And I laughed at him. And I says, my patriotism is to the people of Derry. He says, you've been a naughty boy, things like that, like doing what you did, recording the army. And I says, isn't it well I did? Because there'll be no dispute about what happened on Bloody Sunday. The evidence is there now what happened on Bloody Sunday. And he, and he said, well, I'll tell you, you destroy those tapes or they'll destroy you. And so he wouldn't take the tapes. And that was during the week. Sunday morning, my business premises in William Street was broken into and the uh, place was blown up. The fire had, was so intense that um, it burnt the place down. His report said uh, in its key finding that uh, the soldiers wouldn't have opened fire had they not come under armed attack in the first place. Woodry was such a shock when it came out. You know, we were looking for justice, we were looking for the truth. And for the, tr you know, the, the truth was there. Lord Wisery said that at least six of those who were dead could be shown through forensic evidence uh, to have been handling guns or bombs immediately before. The official verdict on the killing really says that your relative deserved to die, uh, that they brought it on themselves, that it was their own fault. And that lie insults the memory of the dead. Day after day after day after day. That keeps it alive. On the 30th of January each year, Derry remembers the dead by retracing the steps of those shot on the Civil Rights March. Derry didn't take the results of the witchery inquiry lying down. The families and friends of those shot came together to form the Bloody Sunday Justice Campaign, a campaign which aimed to pressure the British government to commission a new inquiry into what happened on Bloody Sunday. The one thing that unites them is the determination not only to get the truth, to find the truth, but have the truth accepted as the official account of Bloody Sunday in history. We want history to say, this is what happened. This was murder by the British Army on our streets. My father, John Duddy, would have campaigned for John over the last 38 years. There's tens of thousands of people in Derry and around the world that Bloody Sunday is personal to them. And a lot of people, that's why so many people campaigned and supported us. It was people uniformed to represent the British state who did the killing on Bloody Sunday. So the conflict, really, about the truth uh, of the Bloody Sunday, Sunday episode has been a conflict between the British Army and the British ruling class standing behind their army on the one hand and working class people in Derry uh, on the other. That's the shape of the conflict as I see it. The 30th of January 1997 was the 25th anniversary of Bloody Sunday and 40,000 people took to the streets to commemorate those shot, but the Widgery Inquiry still stood. In 
1997, Britain elects a new government, and the following year, the Bloody Sunday Justice Campaign finally got what it wanted. The government commissioned a new Bloody Sunday inquiry, headed up by a British judge, Lord Savile. What made Derry different is that for all sorts of historical and political reasons, we had the capacity to force the British government to investigate this properly. There's nothing unique, really, about what happened in Derry, other than that the victims were white, uh, English-speaking, media-savvy, self-confident people with allies uh, outside their own community, pressing for the truth to be told. That's not true of people in Sierra Leone. It's not true in Afghanistan today. So in a way, the inquiry into Bloody Sunday stands as a sort of, uh, in some ways, a substitute for proper inquiries elsewhere. And the truth revealed by the Savile Tribunal will, to some extent, in an important symbolic way, stand for the truth uh, for other people who have suffered under uh, state repression and who are not able to achieve the type of inquiry which uh, a, a, the Bloody Sunday families achieved. You destroy those tapes or they'll destroy you. The tapes were in the building originally, but I had a premonition that with Woodsy saying to me, either they, you destroy the tapes or they'll destroy you, I said, well, I'll take the tapes and brought them to my friend across the border. And I said, uh, Tom, guard those with your life and don't let anyone know you have them because your life would be in danger uh, to get them. And what he did, he took a plastic milk bottle type thing and the tapes were put into that and sealed all up and he dug a hole in the garden, buried them in the, in the garden the plastic container, which was waterproof and all that sort of thing. And they were there for years until I eventually, the Bloody Sunday crowd wanted them and they know all about it. And I went down and I said, and they got out the spade and dug up in his garden a wee patch of grass and there was the tapes. And I still have the container they were in, sitting in there with the tapes. Jimmy Porter submitted his tapes to the Bloody Sunday Inquiry. This time, they were accepted. When the inquiry was first commissioned, some of the families had expected it to take a couple of years. But it took longer, and there were delays. Lord Savile wrote to some of the families to explain why. was finally completed in early 2010 and was due to be published in March that year. But the publication date was set back once again, this time because of the upcoming British general election. When a new government is elected, it commits to publishing the inquiry in a matter of weeks, but by that time it was too late for some. And I have accepted. Six weeks ago my father died. When my father had campaigned for 38 years representing Johnny, I would have taken a back seat to all his phone and told me about it. But from the day six weeks before, it was to come out on the 22nd of March after like, six cancellations. And if it had come out, my father would have seen it. He would have went to his grave knowing that everybody was cleared. June the 15th, 2010, publication at last. But can Derry breathe a sigh of relief? What will the results of the Savile inquiry be?
As tradition dictates, the families retrace the steps of the civil rights march. Select family members will then go into the Guildhall, the town's main building, to see the report half an hour before David Cameron makes a speech to Parliament. If the truth is, the full truth is exposed about this bloody British military operation in Derry on Bloody Sunday, then it surely casts a shadow on the fraudulent and false stories told by Britain about its adventures elsewhere. Mr. Speaker, I am deeply patriotic. I never want to believe anything bad about our country. I never want to call into question the behavior of our soldiers and our army, who I believe to be the finest in the world. Mr. Speaker, these are shocking conclusions to read and shocking words to have to say. There is no doubt, there is nothing equivocal, there are no ambiguities. What happened on Bloody Sunday was both unjustified and unjustifiable. <laughs> Savile says, the immediate responsibility for the deaths and injuries on Bloody Sunday lies with those members of support company whose unjustifiable firing was the cause of those deaths and injuries. <laughs> the government is ultimately responsible for the conduct of the armed forces. And for that, on behalf of the government, indeed on behalf of our country, I am deeply sorry. constant thoughts all these long years is the innocence of our loved ones. That was the verdict we wanted. That is the verdict we have today. That will be the verdict of history for all time. That is what matters. Quite literally within hours of the bloody Sunday killings, I, like a lot of other people, were determined that we were going to get to the bottom of this, that we were going to see this thing through, however long it took. It took 38 years, but we've made it. <laughs> 